So you'll understand this, man. When I went out of the country for the first time to Ukraine, I was so amazed at how different everything was. I mean, when I got off the plane in the airport, you look at the signs, and not only is the language different, but the alphabet is different. So I couldn't even sound things out. They use letters I'd never seen before. I went outside the airport and there were um, cars driving around that I'd never seen before. I mean, we'd drive uh, Fords and Chevys, and, but over there they had cars like um, Lada and Anton or Atons and just cars I'd never seen before. And just the culture was completely different. Now, the group that we were with, they gave us a little pamphlet to try to help us acclimate to the culture. And so they told us things like, don't go anywhere without your passport. They told us things like, um, you know, trust your... Um, uh, your translator. They told us things like um, uh, before you eat any of the, the fruit or the uh, fresh produce, make sure that you wash it because they don't use any pesticides over there. And they said things like um, they gave us a list of superstitions because over in Eastern Europe, apparently superstitions are kind of a, it's just a bigger deal. People take them more seriously than we do here in the United States. And so some funny things came out of that. One is I sat down at the table to eat with this family and man, they put out a spread. I mean, you would have thought we were princes and princesses over there. It was just amazing. At the middle of the table was this, um, was this bowl of cherries. And now I'm used to cherries on the top of a Sunday, right? Like about this big. These things were like the size of apples. They were these huge cherries and people were eating them. And so I went, okay, so they've been washed and they had. And I grabbed a cherry and I grabbed another cherry. That was about five or six cherries into this thing. And my friend leans over to me, another American guy, and he goes, hey, aren't you taking the worm out of the middle? I was like, what are you talking about? Like, that was not in the pamphlet, okay? What are you talking about? And he said, well, yeah, they don't use pesticides. And my translator told me, you gotta open it up and there's a little tiny white worm, you just take it out. And I'm like, well, that would have been nice to know like six worms ago, okay? <laughs> they are in my belly right now. That is disgusting, right? So that was kind of funny. Another thing that happened to me in this, uh, in this different country was we went to a church service and the worship was real upbeat and awesome. And then they had a baptism. And when they did the baptism, it was like everybody just got really reverent and silent. And it was just, it was really cool. It was like the Holy Spirit of God just came into the room and man, everybody just instinctively bowed their heads and closed their eyes that this person was getting baptized. Well, a guy that was with us, an American guy, apparently it was too quiet for him. And he thought that we needed to have amazing grace, but the guy can't sing. So he decides he's going to whistle amazing grace. So here's the scene, everybody head bowed, eyed closed. And he's like, Now, he did a good job, all right, but what he didn't read in the pamphlet, apparently, is that one of the superstitions is that when you whistle indoors, it is calling evil spirits into the place, okay? <laughs> so here we are, people getting baptized, and the great American is calling people, you know, demons from the depths of hell into this place. It was just crazy, all right. So I don't know the last time you felt like an outsider. Maybe it wasn't in a foreign country. Maybe it was just you were new to school. Uh, and you had to try to find the lunch table to sit at. Or maybe you were uh, new at work, or maybe you moved to the neighborhood, and you felt like an outsider or a, or a foreigner. Well, th that's what this series is all about. We're calling it Citizens, because the Bible talks about the fact that we are citizens of the kingdom of God, that we're like citizens of heaven, and, and really that that is kind of our first allegiance is to God. In, in Peter, 1 uh, Peter 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles. And the Greek word there is real interesting. You can translate it exiles, but I think a better translation is uh, foreigners or travelers or literally someone passing through. In other words, you don't really belong, you're just kind of passing through. And those that are in Christ, if you're a Christ follower, then this is not our ultimate home. It's not the ultimate place where we have allegiance. The best way to, that I like to talk about it is we're the visiting team. You ever experience being the visiting team? We're not the home team. You know, when you're the visiting team, you, you come and, and you come into their stadium and sometimes you get booed. And the truth is, is that if you're really following Jesus, and it's more than just a, you know, a religion or a nice thing to do on Sunday, but it really impacts your entire life, there's going to be some people every once in a while that go, 
man, you know, take it easy. Or there's going to be some people that, that, that boo you, you know. And Jesus said to expect that kind of opposition. When you're the visiting team, um, sometimes you get the bad bleachers. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Like the one side of the field's got these amazing bleachers, and then over here you just got these little tiny section. Sometimes you get the bad bleachers, and that's true for Christ followers. Sometimes we don't always get treated fairly in business deals or, or whatever. That's just, that's just the way it is. I, I found some uh, examples of this I thought were interesting. Uh, I came across an article in the news that told about a middle school student who wanted to promote a prayer event at her school. She was barred from putting up the flyer because the flyer had a Bible verse on it that quoted Jesus talking about God's love for the world. So I'm like, okay, if that's the rule, that's the rule. But look at this. What was interesting about the article is that it also gave examples of other flyers that were allowed in the school. And one of them was promoting the rapper Lil Wayne, who was talking and quoting, talking about good weed and alcohol. So I just thought that was really interesting. That one was okay, but the one about God loves everybody is not okay. A school district I read about this year removed all religious references from a Christmas song. So uh, there was the, the, the tradition every year that they would sing Silent Night. But they, they sang it, but they removed all religious le- references, which I'm like, so what do you do, hum it? Like, the, how do you take all the, like the whole thing is religious references. I thought that was interesting. A North Carolina pastor was relieved of his duties as honorary chaplain of the State House of Representatives because he closed his prayer by saying, in the name of Jesus, Amen. So people said, no, nope, foul, you're out, you can't do that. And, and I don't share those things to whine with you. I'm not whining about that. I'm throwing it out there as examples that, guys, we need to sort of expect opposition if we're following Jesus in a culture that doesn't. If you're a Christ follower, how do you live in a culture that doesn't? You know, Jesus said, expect that kind of opposition. So when it comes to you, When you stand up for integrity at work and somebody says, no, 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 you've got to cut corners and fudge the truth to make the sale, and because you won't do that, we're going to give the promotion to somebody else, and you go, well, that's not fair. That seems like discrimination. You shouldn't be surprised by that because Jesus said those kinds of things are going to happen to followers of Jesus. In fact, you shouldn't worry about opposition happening. We should probably worry if opposition doesn't happen in our life, it might be a clue as to how closely or diligently we are actually following Jesus. So the question today is this, how do Jesus followers live in a culture that doesn't follow Jesus? Does that make sense? And, and my assignment, that's what this series is all about, citizens. And my assignment today, I, I wanted to look at the life of Daniel. Because you talk about a guy who followed God in a culture that doesn't, Daniel is a great example. Now, Daniel's one of my favorite biographies in the Old Testament. If you have time, go home this week, read through the book of Daniel. There's some amazing stories in there. I love it. But one thing that's interesting about Daniel is that from a very early age, he's put up in front of people as a leader. He's on stages. He's at the head of the table. He's a person of influence. And so he's a public figure that never gets uh, you know, into any kind of scandal, never does, seems to do anything wrong, seems to always get it right. It's just it's an interesting Bible character to me because you would think that's how the writers of the Bible would paint all the heroes in the Bible, but the truth is that's not the way it happens. In fact, if you're here today and you're kind of a skeptic, I'm kind of a skeptic sometimes, but if you're kind of sitting back and you're saying, I'm not into the Jesus thing yet, can I just say to you that one of the reasons that I believe in the Bible and believe in Jesus is because the writers of the Bible actually told you how it was. They didn't candy coat anything. See, I'm thinking if you're trying to make up a religion, then you're going to paint all the heroes as sort of always perfect, always getting it right. But the Bible doesn't do that. The Bible has a guy like, you know, Moses who killed a man. Noah who got drunk and did all sorts of horrible things. Uh, David, the man after God's own heart, committed adultery and even murder. And so one of the things that I love about the Bible and one of the things I love about God is that he's able to use messed up people. That's good news for us, folks, right? Look to the person next to you and go, man, God could use even somebody like you. Go ahead and do that. (laughs) Doesn't that feel good? (laughs) That's awesome. 
All right, but see, Daniel, Daniel's just kind of different. You read his story, and he didn't have any big scandals in his life. It's just amazing. But anyway, back to the story. In 650 B.C., uh, Daniel 1 explains that um, basically Jehoiakim is the Jewish king, and Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, bad guys, Jewish king, uh, Daniel, these are the people of God. And um, what's interesting about Babylon is when we say they're evil, that's not just us judging like, they were evil. You can go back and look in history, and I don't mean like just Bible Christian history. I mean, just go back in history and look at what the Babylonian Empire was doing at this time, King Nebuchadnezzar. These guys were sacrificing children in worship. They were taking, um, you know, foreign nations and just doing horrible things to their women and to captives and different things like this. Just an amazingly evil, evil Nation. They, they worshipped their gods, their pagan gods, and crazy rituals, sexual rituals, just, just horrible place. And in fact, if you were here a few weeks ago when we talked about Revelation, one of the beasts of the apocalypse was referred to as Babylon because of how evil uh, reputation this place had. Well, they had come along, okay, and they have sieged or laid siege to Jerusalem. And what that means is they sort of cut off all the supplies to Jerusalem. So now the people in Jerusalem are starving. And once they're so weak that they can't really fight back anymore, now King Nebuchadnezzar and his people invade Jerusalem. And they, you know, they murder people. They do all sorts of horrible things. They, anyway, uh, go read about it. It's horrible. Um, uh, or maybe don't read about it. But um, basically what happens is they take all the treasures from the temple I mean, all this, the, the people had sacrificed for, and just, just amazing stuff. And then here's what happened in verse 3. This is what I want to get to. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family in the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, so think Clark Gable, Robert Redford, Brad Tate, and... Uh, <laughs> Showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand. So these are the sharpest people, the creme de la creme here, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. And among these were from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So understand what's happening here. They have come in and they've pillaged the city, but then they take the best of the best of the young leaders. So we have some great young leaders. Maybe some of them are in here today, 15, 16 years old. That's how old these guys were. And the, the Nebuchadnezzar took them took them 720 miles away to a foreign, to Babylon, and tried to train them in Babylonian culture. So we're going to teach you how to worship our gods in our crazy ways. We're going to teach you the values of why it's okay to go into another uh, nation and just obliterate them. We're going we're gonna to come in here and teach you these things, and, and we're going to mess with your identity too, by the way, because we're going to take your Jewish names, and those are no longer your names anymore. In fact, they named Daniel, um, the name actually meant son of Marduk, and that was one of their pagan gods. So it'd be like you know, me, or somebody taking one of our, our 15-year-old guys and saying, hey, you're now son of Satan, and you have to hear that every day of your life. So I mean, it just... I mean, you think about somebody who's, you know, coming into a place where there's different customs, different values, different laws. This is Daniel living as a follower of God in a culture that doesn't follow God. So here's a couple of things I think we can learn from him. In verse 8, it says this, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. And so in other words, one of the things they're doing is they're giving him certain food and wine and asking him uh, to be a part of this. And Daniel's saying, no, I cannot do this. Now to us, we go, well, what's the big deal? But for Daniel, God had given the Israelites um, dietary restrictions, not to uh, be a killjoy, but to ensure their health. And Daniel is being fed some of these things, and he's going, no, I, I cannot eat these things. And the wine, I mean, what's wrong with, you know, a glass of wine? But 
they are coming in their culture, when they drank wine, the Babylonians would always toast a pagan god. They used that moment to worship a pagan god. And so for Daniel, he's going, I, I, I resolve that I cannot defile myself in this way. It would have been so easy to just go along with what was going on around you. It would have been so easy for Daniel to rationalize and say, hey, we're captives. Hey, we, re we really don't have an option. I mean, hey, God will understand. It's just a tiny exception. And it begs the question, when we live in this culture that doesn't follow God, how much compromise morally is okay? How much sin is okay? When I was 12 years old, I, my dad took me out to play golf, started teaching me golf. And um, we were on some hole, and I remember it was a par four, and we both went off the tee. He went this way into the rough, and I went this way, probably out of bounds, probably the next state over, I don't know. But we went opposite ways, and my dad's over here, and somehow I got to the green before him. But I saw him make his shot from the rough. He gets it up to the green, chips on the green, and makes his first putt. So we're coming off the green. I said, you know, I'm writing you down for a four, Dad. And he said, well, no, write me down for a five. And I said, what are you talking about? It was a shot off the tee from the rough to the green. You chipped on and you made your putt. That's four. And he said, well, yeah, son, but the rough was really deep over there. And what you didn't see was that when you thought I was taking all those practice swings, <laughs> one of those swings, actually, I swung at the ball and this grass was so deep, I actually swung completely under the ball, and the ball just kind of went bloop, bloop, like this. And uh, so you need to understand there is a rule in golf that if you intend to hit the ball and you swing and you miss, that counts as a stroke. And I'm thinking, goodness, if I played that way, I'd have like another 20 strokes on my shot here. This is horrible. Um, but my dad said, no, you got to do that. And so I wrote him down for a five, and I learned something that day. I learned why there's so many folks, and he's been a businessman in Cincinnati for a long time. And I learned that my dad has incredible integrity and character. And I, I learned why people, you know, ask him for advice and kind of look up to him and ask for help and stuff like that. My dad was faithful in, in those small things. He could be trusted in those small things, and people knew if that was true, he could be trusted with some of the bigger and more important things. In fact, that's what Jesus said. He said, if you're faithful in the small things, I'll put you in charge of many things. It's interesting to me that here's Daniel doing the right thing when it comes to just diet alone. And then next thing you know, if you read through the book of Daniel, Daniel's a part of some of the most spectacular, miraculous moments. I mean, just epic stories. Because why? He could be trusted in the small things. And so God steward, let him steward some big assignments. Now, it's interesting. I mean, the answer to the question, by the way, is how much moral compromise is okay? It's like none. How much sin is okay? None. But these things, they'll start, you know, in our mind. They always start in our mind, even with some of the smaller things. They always start that compromise in our mind. In fact, I, I read this, and so I wanted to share it with you. It says, sow a thought, reap a deed. Sow a deed reap a habit, sow a habit, reap a character, sow a character, reap a destiny. It always starts in our mind. It always starts out small and seemingly insignificant. You know, we stretch the truth to make ourselves look a little better for the interviewer. Or we have, uh, we deceive our spouse and say something like, no, no, nothing's going on. He's just a good friend. Or we have selective memory when it comes to filling out our taxes and we say things to ourselves like, you know, everybody fudges on this stuff. And I don't, I don't like the way the government spends my money anyway. And so we compromise a little bit of our integrity in those small things. And, and it all starts in our mind. And so I would ask you, I'm just imagining, like, what was Daniel thinking about? What was in his mind? Did, did he think about his, his Jewish upbringing and all those verses and Levitical laws that he had memorized? Is that what helped him have great character? the Bible? Was it that he thought about um, his family? Like, I can't do this. If my mom ever found out, you know, 
Maybe he was thinking about his family. Um, maybe he was thinking about uh, all the other captives that would watch him do that. Because, you know, he was always listed first. It was always Daniel and then all the other ones. Maybe he was sort of a leader among them. And he was thinking to themselves, you know what, if I do this, it will dishearten all the other captives. And they'll follow in my footsteps. What was he thinking about that helped him have great character? I would say that, you know, if you want to live following God in a culture that doesn't, maybe you need to think about some of those things. Maybe think about the Bible. Remember Paul said in Philippians, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's, you know, he had had this long list. He said, think about these things. Maybe before you're ready to make that small compromise, you think things like, what would this do to my family? Or you look around at some of your peers and you go, man, what would this do to my small group if I did this? What would this do to my church if I did this? In Hebrews 12, 1, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Listen to this again. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. So the first thing I would say is um, we need to not compromise. But the second thing I would say is we need to live our faith out loud. Daniel talked to that chief official. He didn't try to hide anything. He didn't say, hey, you know what, I'm allergic to wine. He didn't say anything like, oh, you know, that food always gives me indigestion. Like he just told him, like, I don't want to defile myself in this way. Like I can't. This is, I'm a God follower So he lived his faith out loud. And I think that's one of the things we need to be able to do in this culture. If you're a follower of Jesus here today, you need to be able to live uh, out loud that faith. So let me ask you, like, do your neighbors know that you're a Christ follower? Does your family know that you're a Christ follower? See, if we're around people for any significant time, I'm thinking that should come up. If my faith is more than just an hour on Sunday and it's really something that's impacting every part of my life, then my dentist ought to know that I'm a follower of Jesus. I love those little stickers that people, that you guys are putting on your car, the 242 stickers. You guys are walking around. I was reading in the Hebrew the other day and in the Hebrew it actually says, if you want to go to heaven, put one of these stickers on your car. It's an amazing thing. You got to really look for it, but it's in there. No, but I love that. It's encouraging to me that there are people walking around town like, yeah, you know what? You're living your faith out loud. I'm trying to as well. It's encouraging, you know, to each other. Um, One of the places I try to live my faith out loud is uh, (laughs) Great Clips of all places. I go and I get my hair cut at Great Clips and and I've been trying to invite them to church. And some of those uh, ladies have come to church, which has been an amazing thing. Some of you guys have helped with that because um, every December they know now to expect the donuts from 242 at Christmas time. So it's really, really cool. But anyway, there's this one lady that cuts hair there, and we are Amy. And she's always, I mean, we just have this special relationship where we're teasing each other. And she'll tease me, like she'll be cutting my hair, and she goes, Wow, it's really thinning here on top. And I'm like, Oh, you shut your mouth. You don't say that, you know. Or or she'll say, uh, or or I'll say, Hey, you ought to come to church, and she'll go, I'm not going to your church. I bet it's a bunch of hypocrites. And I'm always like, Well, there's always room for one more. We'd love to have you come, you know. I mean, we just have that kind of a relationship, you know. But I'm telling you, the last time I got my hair cut, she leaned down at one point and all the teasing aside, and she said, she asked me a question, and it was a real question about a real hard issue in her life. And she wanted to know, like, how do you explain that? What does God have to say about that? And so in the middle of Great Clips, you know, we're having this real spiritual conversation. And I really believe Amy took, you know, it might be small, but took a next step with God. So much so that I want you to welcome Amy right back here. Stand up, Amy. If you, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. She's not here. Don't. I apologize. That would be great, though. I mean, that would be a wonderful ending to that story if she was here. Man, I feel bad. Some of you were weeping. You were like, oh, Amy's here. She's here. I apologize. 
But the point is, I mean, I hope that's the way it ends someday. I hope that not, you know, not the fake out, but I hope she comes someday, you know. But none of that happens if we're hiding our faith. So tell somebody about your faith in Jesus. Daniel uh, 1.9 says this, Now God had caused the official to show favor or sympathy to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? Uh, the king would have my head because of you. And then Daniel responds. Uh, Daniel said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over the guys, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat, water to drink, then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and he tested them for 10 days. And so the third thing that I would have us do if we're going to be followers of Jesus in a culture that doesn't is we need to be able to trust God with every area of our lives. Trust God with every, like Daniel trusted with his physical appearance, trusted him with his food, trusted him really with his life to make this kind of a stink in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. He trusted God with everything. Is there anything in your life that you're not trusting God with? Do you trust God with your money? Do you trust God with your relationships? And, your faith? and what I mean by that is, you know, what God says about relationships. Are you following those things? Do you trust God with your future? Or do you try to grind it out and make it work your own way? Do you trust God See, I, I think that part of the reason that our culture is not too interested in church or God is because there's a lot of us that we don't really trust God enough in our lives to really follow him in every area and to really um, take a risk if he calls us to take a risk. There are those people who are out there who are looking at us and going, well, they're just, they act just kind of the same way we do, except they go to church on, for an hour on, on the weekend. I mean, do you trust Jesus when he says, the first shall be last and the last shall be first? Do you trust Jesus when he says it's better to give than to receive? Do you trust Jesus when he says, turn the other cheek? That's the way you should live. Do, do you trust Jesus when he says, love your neighbor? Are you spending so much time focused on your family? Do you trust Jesus when he says, pray for your enemy? That that's how you need to live. See, I think, I think one of the reasons that our children are falling away from the church is that they're watching a generation of us who are so concerned with safety, so concerned with kind of fitting in with everybody in our culture, so concerned with, you know, getting ahead financially, that we're living such boring lives. We're not on an adventure following God no matter what. So the 15-year-olds are looking at us and going, well, pfft. That's not that interesting. I mean, think about, think about what it would do to your family. Think about what it would do to the people at work when you say, yeah, uh, you got vacation time coming up. Yeah, I do. What are you going to do? You guys going to, going to Florida or something? It's like, well, I'm actually uh, going to go down with a group from my church. We're going to go down to Haiti, and there's people down there. We're going to make sure they get water, and uh, there's, we're going to build a school for kids and a church for them down there. Like, what impact would that have on people when you start living like that? There's a guy that um, takes middle school boys and brings them over to his house on Wednesdays. I know because my son is one of them. And he sits there and, and they, they throw hatchets and they shoot bow and arrow and they talk about fishing and stuff because somebody's got to teach my son how to be a man, all right? <laughs> so he's doing all that stuff. And then but right after that, they open the Bible and he teaches them what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And I'm thinking to myself, what does that do when his neighbor says, what are all those cars doing over at your house? And he says, well, I'm actually, I'm discipling, you know, a few young men on how to be followers of Jesus. And this guy's over here flipping the remote, watching Wheel of Fortune all the time. Like, that's the life I want to live. What do you need to trust God with? You know how it ended up for Daniel? Daniel. It says, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. 
So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables and said, at the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. And the king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Meshael, uh, and Azariah. And so they entered the king's service in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them. He found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. You see, because they did not compromise, because they lived their faith out loud, and because they trusted God with everything, they started to get elevated and get more and more influence and impact in the culture. I love that. And so let me ask you, what do you need to trust God with for the next 10 days? They trusted God for 10 days. Maybe that's just a good starting point for you. What is it in your life that you need to trust God with just for the next 10 days? The band's gonna come out, but let me give you some things to think about. Maybe for you, it's, you know what? I'm gonna stop gossiping for 10 days. Maybe for you, it's, you know what? I'm gonna open up my Bible and I'm gonna read it for the next 10 days. I'm going to trust God with that. I'm going to trust God with my family, and um, I'm going to lead my family in prayer when we eat a meal. I'm going to do it for 10 days. Maybe for you, it's saying, you know what, I'm going to trust God with my future and my significance, and my because I'm not going to get any of that from work and my success. In fact, I'm going to cut my work day off at a certain time. I'm going to come home. I'm going to eat dinner with my family and make them the priority for the next 10 days. This is a part of the message where it doesn't, it's not really about what I say. It's about what you hear from God. And I really believe that you kind of open up your spiritual ears and spiritual eyes. And God's going to tell you what your next step is. What do you need to do for the next 10 days? You need to make sure that um, you don't stay up late at night looking at the computer for the next 10 days. You need to stop smoking for the next 10 days. Stop drinking for the next 10 days. I don't know. To say, hey, for the next 10 days, I'm not going to hang out with those, that crowd of people. For 10 days, and then I'll see what happens. You know what, for the, the next uh, 10 days, I'm going to make sure that every morning I pray. I don't know what it is for you. But I really believe that God has a next step for everybody in this room, including me. And I'm praying through this weekend, God, what is it that you're calling me to do for the next 10 days?